Moro Moro, and welcome back to Culinary Role Playing. I do apologize this condescending point of view. <laughs> I'm in the middle of a move over here, so I'm trying to work with the space I have right now. <laughs> this was the space today. And I also want to thank you. We reached 1000 subscribers, which is amazing. I'm still going to do the Q&A video next week, and you guys can still leave comments down below and ask me questions either in this video or in my posts that I have put on my page as well. We have now taken one step closer for me being able to do this full time, which is just amazing. My only ambition is to get into a position where I could make this content full time and make even more flashier videos and even more videos per every week. But now I really wanted to try something different, something that we haven't tried before. So actually today we are doing an overview video of Shadow of the Weird Wizard. And Shadow of the Weird Wizard is a game from Robert J. Schwalp and from Schwalp Entertainment, which are the creators of Shadow of the Demon Lord. Robert Schwalp was one of the original creators behind 5th edition and how it works today. Schwalp had many different ideas for this kind of D20 at fantasy game. Ideas like multiclassing should be a thing that is like heavily emphasized on and also like how many attributes there should be and how the modifiers should work. But of course D&D having the package of the past it wasn't easy to change those things that much. So what Schwalp did is he created Shadow of the Demon Lord, which is this very Diablo-ish dark fantasy, heroic fantasy system in a sense. It also had levels. You had your novice path, your expert path and master path. But Shadow of the Demon Lord was very this kind of dark fantasy type of ordeal, which meant that it might have not been for everybody. And now Schwalp has come out with Shadow of the Weird Wizard, which is basically the high fantasy version of Shadow of the Demon Lord. Yes, it kind of uses the same engine, but it definitely tries to be its own game. And it has quite a lot of upgrades into its system. So today we are taking a look at the new Shadow of the Weird Wizard book, I will give you the good, I will give you the bad, I will give you the ugly. I will give you the things I think are very great in this book. I will give you my ideas on how I would probably modify the game if I would play it. And then I will also talk about things that I maybe feel a little iffy about. Maybe I don't like that much. But let's first take a look at the character sheet because that always tells you the most about the whole system. So here we have the whole character sheet and I will also maybe from time to time just add the Shadow of the Demon Lord character sheet in here as well so we can make some comparisons between those two. Well first of all we can see that the game uses the same attributes that the first game used which are strength, agility, intellect and will. And we have here this slash, which means that we have our different scores and our modifiers. Modifiers are very simple in Shadow of the Demon Lord and Shadow of the Weird Wizard. It's just every number after 10 is basically a modifier. Example, if my strength would be 13, that would mean my strength modifier would be 3. Then we have speed and size, very simple stuff. The health system is a little bit different. I really enjoyed, I really loved Shadow of the Demon Lord's system where you had your basically your base health, you had your healing rate, which was I think a quarter of your health. So you didn't have to stress about different like healing abilities because normally if you had like a healing spell or if you had like abilities that gave you healing, it was probably either your healing rate or twice your healing rate. So it was very simple to do. And I love that. Here they went kind of different route. You don't have the healing rate anymore. It's gone because they wanted to have more heroic kind of game, which means more health. And it also means a different way to handle healing and health overall. 
I know it, it, this game aims to be more heroic, more powerful, like high power heroic fantasy game. But maybe I still don't kind of... I'm not sure what I think about this new health system. I kind of like it, but I also don't like it. Let's get back to that a little bit later. Then what we also have, we have bonus damage, which is a basically like a pool of D6s. This game only uses D20, which you use to do your ability rolls, your attack rolls and all that stuff. And then you use D6s to everything else. So usually for damage and if you have things like Banes and Boons, which will either help your action rolls or hinder your action rolls, then they are also D6s. So bonus damage is basically a damage pool in this game. So you have different amount of D6s that you will get more when you level up, depending on which novice paths, expert paths and master paths you take. And I also like this system. Let's dive into that a little bit deep a little bit later. But yeah, that, that is a good change. Then you have your defense. Then you have your background descriptions, professions, traits, talents and all that jazz. Nothing really major, really simple character sheet. Then you have your character name and level. So I'm not gonna go through whole book. Like I have now explained, the basic premise is really simple. It's a D20 adventure game where you always try to roll basically 10. So whenever you have a skill check or attribute check to be made, the base level is 10. Or for example, if you're making a roll of strength against a certain type of creature, then you would use the creature's strength attribute and strength score as the difficulty rating. So overall, very basic heroic fantasy adventure system. You go into different adventures, you will do some different attributes checks to try to overcome different obstacles and then you go into fights with, with different kinds of creatures and stuff. Everything that you would expect from D&D 5th edition, Pathfinder, Dragonbane, you can fi find in this game. Basically how the advancements work in this game, what I really loved about Shadow of the Demon Lord, which is still present in Shadow of the Weird Wizard, is that your character gets something special every level and that is still the case and also with these three different tiers of paths that you can take from novice from expert from master you can make very varied types of characters with very different abilities first level you gain benefits from your novice path in the second level you also get gain another benefits from your novice path then you will level three choose the expert path that will give you additional benefits and then you at level four you get another tier of expert path then you get level five benefits from your novice path again then you go back to expert then you choose benefits from your master path at level seven uh, and you will go all the way up to level 10 and i love that the game only has 10 levels while it's all epic and cool it takes so much time for people to reach to the actual tw level 20 and after level 10, the abilities start to be really, really like crazy powerful. Even with the premise of having these heroic adventures, I think level 20 levels is quite a lot of stuff that you have to like push in into every level. And even statistics say that usually people tend to play around level 13 until they stop and start again. So yeah, I definitely feel like 10 levels is more than enough and it will give you enough things to do. I think there is not a lot, lot more to just like say in general about the system. Now I will just start to nitpick all the things I like about the book, what I would probably fine tune in the book and what other things that I really felt like, hmm, they made me wonder. So first thing I really liked about the system is the idea of doubling and dividing. So when in Shadow of the Demon Lord you had the healing rate that would give you the certain amount of health, Shadow of the Demon Lord used du doubling and dividing, which means that you count your damage basically in a different place where you have your health and when you where you have your current health. So when you have taken 
let's say 14 points of damage. Then when you get a healing effect, that normally says that you will divide your damage taken, which means that if you have taken 14 damage, you would heal seven. So that means the more damage you have taken, the more will you heal. It gives the feeling that you will get from half health quite quickly, but to fully heal, it will take some time. And I, and I like that idea and aspect. And the doubling and dividing goes into different other aspects as well, not just healing and health. I also like the bonus damage. I think it's really neat idea that in certain levels, instead of having like exactly the exact amount of bonus damage, the bonus damage is basically a dice pool of d6s of extra damage that you can add into different attacks when you want to. And you can even trade in this this damage to make multiple attacks. So for example, if you ha would have a character that has three d6s of extra damage, you could take two of those d6s and make additional attack per turn. I think this balances wonderfully the damage scaling of the fighters as well. And also while balancing the damage output gives you more option within the fighting scene. Then this is something that some people have said that they don't really like, but personally I really like the idea. So the magic system has been revamped a little bit. So how the magic worked basically in Shadow of the Demon Lord, you basically had power level for your character, which is basically your spell casting level. But because the game is so multi-classing, it was so difficult to balance out like the spell casting levels into different class levels. So they made it a separate thing and some class levels gave you more power levels, which meant more spells and even higher le levels of spells. But what was ridiculous, you gain certain amount of castings per spell level. So for example, if I would have been power level of two, I think I would have had maybe four or five castings of level zero spells, and then I would have two castings of level one spells. And that meant whenever I gained a new spell for level one, I could always cast that spell twice. If you have five casts of level zero spells and you had two casts of level one spells, and you had maybe two level one spells and, and three level zero spells, you could cast 15 <laughs> level zero spells and four, yeah, four level one spells, which is, it's crazy amount of spell casting. And you, in virtually, you had like higher levels, quite a lot of spells to cast. And it felt really weird for, even for dark fantasy games. So I usually used the castings as a spell slots. So you could only cast that certain amount of level one spells per level, not per spell. But what they have done in Shadow of the Weird Wizard is they have added individual castings into the spells themselves. So instead of you having like this unified level of spells, you can just learn new spells. And the higher tier of your, your path is, you can take higher level spells. And there are three tiers of spells, which are novice spells, I think, yeah, expert spells, and then master spells. And depending on the spell and the scale, the spell might have different amount of castings per day. Like fly, for example, in expert aeromancy spells has three castings. But now, when you level up and when you gain more spells, instead of taking new spells, you could pick the same spell again. Like I could take lightning bolt for the second time, this means I can add three more castings. So then I would be able to cast Lightning Bolt six times. And I think this is perfect and it simulates the individual studies of a mage. Like if I want to focus more on aeromancy spells and I want to be aeromancy, best aeromancy wizard there is, I can always pick the same spells again and be able to cast them even more times per day. I like this idea. I like this system. It gives you at the same time more flexibility, but it is also a lot more decisions on what spells you want to be able to cast more. So you could be a mage that has varied amount of different spells, but you can cast them few 
times per day or you could focus on certain type of spells and cast them multiple times per day i'm not sure how many spells you will get when you get level 10 like I, it's probably going to be in my humble opinion too much rather than too little i like the idea where this is going overall for me this is a way better way to distribute different spells so well done i really enjoyed this idea okay so next we will go into the territory where i feel like hmm i will i would probably change these things if i would play this game so how damage and death works in shadow of the weird wizard is you are counting the amount of damage that you are taking and you will always compare that to your maximum health so instead of having a health pool like I have 50 HP and then I take damage and then I have 6 HP, you will count, okay, I took 6 damage and I have 14 health, so I'm still fine because it's the, dam the amount of da damage did not go over my maximum health. And when you get a hit that would take you over your maximum amount of health, then you get incapacitated, but the damage never goes over your maximum health so if my current maximum health would be 14 that would mean i would have 14 threshold of damage and this also means even even when you get healed by one hp you will you would get back up on your feet every turn you are incapacitated at the start of your turn you would lose 1d6 health so this means if you would have 14 health you would take 1d6 health away let's say 4 and then you would have new current maximum health that would be 10 and this would also mean your damage threshold would also go into 10 and after that you would roll make a luck roll which basically means is in this game that you will just roll a d20 and if you roll over if you roll 10 or over you will succeed so it's just pure luck. That's why it's called the luck roll. So it's basically like a death saving throw. So yeah, if you would go over and you would succeed, you would heal one damage, which means that now our new maximum HP would be 10 and we would heal one damage. So our damage threshold would be nine. So it would be back up. And if we would fail, we wouldn't heal that damage and we would still be incapacitated. And I like the idea I like the idea of having basically this kind of stamina threshold and then your meat points and dropping of the health will like show you the more bigger injuries that your character has because also healing works in a way that you wipe out all the damage you have taken but to heal your basically your health back to your maximum takes a little bit more time and of course when your character's health would drop to zero then your character would die. While I like the idea, I I can see this game, especially in higher levels, because some characters will get like 16 points more health per level. They are like basically, are even like fighters, individuals that get a lot of health. I think so. Well, fighters get like plus six health on first levels, but then there are basically expert path, paths that give you plus 16 health. My point is the game has HP bloat and my other point is when your damage would reach to the health maximum and then you would start, just start to lose 1d6 per turn, it would take quite a lot of time before your character would die, which is fine. But it, I think it's kind of weird mechanic that your damage threshold just stops there and even the amount of hits you would take and even the amount of hit you would take would not like would suddenly stop and not hurt you more which is really weird and i will clarify if you are incapacitated and you take damage that will be reduced from your health which i think that is a very good thing that's how it should be even still you would be in a position like on higher levels when your character would be get knocked out out of like a huge hit but they would have maybe like, <laughs> they would only need to take one damage to be completely knocked out. And then somebody would make like a huge hit, like 30 damage into them, but they only take the one damage and they will just <laughs> jump. They will just jump into zero and stay the same. And then start to lose damage on the next, next rounds when they are taking hits. 
How would I change this rule is, simply put, whenever you would reach your damage threshold, the damage that goes over would already be reduced from your health, right off the bat. So the bigger the hit that would take you out would be even more fatal. And how I would change the luck roll that will determine if you stay incapacitated, I would not reduce the character's health d6 automatically. I would make them first roll the luck roll. And if they succeed, they could come back up. And if they would fail that roll, then they would lose the d6 and not get back up. So I think it, it's a small change, but I think it would really reflect on the big hits that the character can get that will like slightly knock them out for a, like one, one round or sometimes be even more bigger hits and they will take even more damage while they are down. Because you are anyway counting in on the damage threshold and then you are lowering the HP. So I think it wouldn't be much more a bigger bother to also count the damage that goes over the threshold and reduce it right away from the health. But that is kind of a simple thing to do. So that is not that much of a change. Then we go into combat and how initiative and turns work in this game. I think Shadow of the Demon Lord had really nice system where the players had a lot of choices. In Shadow of the Demon Lord, players could decide to take either a quick turn or a slow turn. And when they took a quick turn, they could only do a quick action or move. And when they would want to move and do an action, they would take slow turn. And the enemies could also decide the same thing. And then heroes would most often go first in the in the, the current round, like either in quick turn or either in slow turn. But of course there would be special creatures that would go always first. But in Shadow of the Weird Wizard, they just decided that GM will always go first or the, the Sage's characters will always go first, which is really weird. I. I think they wanted to streamline the turn system, but yeah, it is it is kind of weird to just say that ev every enemy always moves before heroes. And yes, you can use your reaction to basically have a quick turn and go before the enemies, but you would have to use your reaction to do that. And that is a quite big of an ask. So yeah, I, I don't know what I, this is something that I should probably, I should try to play the game first in order to really see what was the idea behind this idea that the GM always goes first. I know that it might be easier and faster to do things, but uh, I'm not sure if I like it. At least what I would do is to take alternating turns where I could, where I would say, okay, Sage or the GM can start first, but then I would, would just alternate between the uh, the NPC and the enemy characters and players, and all and the players could decide in which order they would go, and then it could be like GM players, GM players, GM players at least, because it feels like kind of harsh that all the enemies can move before the players can. This might be something that surprisingly works amazingly well in this system, but yeah, it feels iffy. And then I have to say, I'm not sure what, what I feel about the action economy of the game. We have basically your basic action that you can use to attack, you can use to cast a spell, you can do other major stuff. Then you have your movement, which comes from your speed. And then we also talked about the reaction. Okay, that, that's fine enough. But then you basically have also have minor activities which is basically like your quick actions or bonus actions and you will use your movement to pay and do these things and i think it's kind of confusing for new players to first think about the action they want to do and then they have to think about how much movement points they want to use in order to draw or stow a weapon or pull a lever or take something out of their bag. It's like if you would go this route, then I would just change that you have certain amount of action points. And then you could also have the quick turn action that you can take that will cost certain amount of actions and then you would go 
before any character but then you can have lesser actions so like if you still want to use the initiative system that the game uses so yeah i would then if you are going on this meta uh, action point currency route while still having differentiated actions and stuff I, I would just make action point system so yeah i would probably if i would ever run this game i would probably just try to homebrew and and try to figure out a, some kind of like action point system for this because this is really unnecessarily like divided into different things that will make it just unnecessarily more complicated then another just this is very nitpicky thing but defend works in this game that you will use your action to defend if your enemy succeeds in an attack against you you will make a luck roll and on a success you turn the enemy's success into a failure why this is put behind luck defending i know it tries to be simplified but why not just give banes for the attack like i really don't like it feels really weird to put it behind luck which has nothing to do with the, um, the way you defend yourself or try to protect yourself you will just <laughs> it will based on luck on how well you can defend yourself and it doesn't sit quite right with me this is just a nitpick but when but this i think this is a perfect example that shows how important it is how you name and utilize your mechanics if you have a mechanic called luck and the whole point is that it's just a stroke of luck it is affected by nothing just by your pure chance and then you will make an active action that relies on the luck on a on an aspect that should come from your ability to defend yourself it just doesn't sit quite right with me this might be just me nitpicking and pouring into it too much but just just food for your thought like like i said if this would be that you will put banes on enemies attack that would make more sense because it's like yeah i am actively trying to hinder the enemy's chances of hitting me so it makes more sense in my brain even though banes are something that are not affected by my personal scores so two different mechanics that are not relied on characters abilities but other one feels like oh this is just a stroke of luck and the other one feels yes i did something i affected this enemy's attack and that's why it was harder for the enemy to hit me and that's how we fool ourselves <laughs> playing tabletop role-playing games but there is also dodge but instead of using action it uses reaction but this would be easy because boons and bane stack so if i would change this because now there's like two different mechanics here so one is with the boon thing and one is with the luck roll if this would be a boon thing as well because you can roll multiple boons in this game if this would be with boons and banes as well then i would use defend i would use my action to provide one bane to enemy and then i could use my reaction to put another bane so enemy would have to attack with two banes so i think it would also stack a little bit better and you would not have to use multiple mechanics just to like resolve the situation then we go into the things that i i am not sure about this is basically a player's handbook so they strip basically everything from ancestries basically everyone start as a human and i don't think it really gives you anything special in the game which i'm not against that if that would be the whole game but they also they just casually mention that okay there is new new book coming right up that has 30 different special ancestries so they definitely have done quite many ancestries already so why not include like the base elves and dwarves and humans when you have them and then give this ancestry as an optional rule that everyone plays at the same base so it's just like yeah I, I know 30 ancestries is too much to put in one book but you couldn't really you couldn't put those humans elves and dwarves into the first set so it feels like like weird divide that oh you have to buy this another book if you want extra ancestry buffs in your game and i think that is really good 
jumping point in my, into my next thing. What I really enjoyed about Shadow of the Demon Lord is when you bought the base game, you actually got a whole book. So you got all you need as a player, you got all you need as a GM as well. There was everything you need to do, how to create adventures. You had your basic bestiary, everything was in that one book. And I love it. I love it when you can actually buy an RPG book that includes everything. But no, they decided to go the money way and they have player's handbook separately. They're probably going to have game master book separately and they're going to probably have beast theory separately. And they're going to probably have an ancestry book separately. And I know this, this book was cheaper. This book was cheaper. But still, I would prefer that there would be one book. Just saying. One book would have been enough. Or at least publish the books at the same time. I don't think even I don't think the Beast Theory or the Game Master book has come even out yet. Word of advice, if you want to buy this book now, there won't be everything you need to play. And I am not sure when they will come out. So at least wait out until they have published at least the Beast Theory book. So then you can actually play this game. That is something that I am not a big fan of. And finally, I have to talk about the art. I'm sorry, I have to talk about the art. Overall, the art direction at the beginning seems quite decent. We have quite decent pictures overall, really nice pictures, nothing to complain. The different styles are quite evident. There is like this, this style that looks a little bit more like a concept artish type of book then we have like this kind of more stylized stylized art as well which is like I know it's difficult to get different like same looking artists in these books but then then we have pictures like this and yeah I don't know what to say and I won't get too hook up on the conversation of AI art. It is a really discussed topic as of late. My quick view of AI and uh, image generation is whether we want it or not, it's going to be a tool in the future that different individuals will use. It will be a tool the same way Photoshop came in the first time and other computer image processing because when those things came around people were like okay art is dead you can do everything now with computer and it's basically cheating we are at the same premise here because people were like taking other people's pictures and then photo bashing which means that taking those pictures and combining them together in my opinion there are ways that you can use image generation when you put effort in it. But here we can clearly see that the background is probably image generated. It is kind of like a picture of uh, like a modern setting. So it doesn't even fit in the picture overall. Then we have this picture that has clearly been made in different contexts because this character is not flying originally. You can already see that in the picture. And <laughs> It's just dark. I, I don't know what to say. Like, <laughs> this clearly has been taken from somewhere else and just at, been added into this picture. And then there is like, I don't want to. I don't want to tear down someone else's work. But clearly, and these dragons are image uh, generated images. You can see that already in here. And like, okay, okay, fine. But then we have pictures like this, like right next to it. And then we have pictures like this on the next page. So it's inconsi highly inconsistent and it's a very really interesting choice. This might be something that they are still working on because I have seen that they have updated still the book. I don't know what is still coming. This is just, I'm wanting to give you this first 
overview of the system what the game looks right now so it might change later i don't know but yeah again kind of like a different art style of things and then there are things that look really good as you can see there are quite many pictures like almost in every page so they wouldn't need this many pictures even so like you don't put pictures for the sake of pictures in your game box art doesn't add anything if you are not careful with it it might even hinder the book itself then we have these black and white pictures as well put in between and they are pictures that doesn't even fit into the description so it's quite weird that we have these uh, like portrait style pictures and we also have these black and white pictures like all mixed up and then we also have this very picture like uh, page frame as well so it's like all over the place and i don't want to like pick on this too much because that's not my point i'm just i just want to show you what you get when you buy this book and another aspect is they are also recycling pictures so we have this crystal over here here we have the dragon again and here we have also the crystal again so they are even like rotating and using the same pictures and as we can see the this these are quite tightly already cluttered with text so I really don't see the point like why to use so many pictures and even put pictures that really don't fit into the text at all like yeah I, I don't this is something that there they, they might have a really good reason to do this there's the picture book again also the <laughs> picture book magic book so yeah they are recycling also the same elements so I'm not an art critic or perfect individual myself, but as a person who is also working on their own book, I think this is quite weird oversight. And and Shadow of the Demon Lord, I think, is a very, very decent, or quite decent book at least. So th this art direction is quite weird. To be honest so yeah uh, my final verdict for this book is that i would not buy it just yet at least like i said the beast theory is not out yet the G game master book is not out yet so let it cook i think they will also update the rules even more so if you want to be the early bird and just uh, jump into the book and see what it has to offer and maybe modify your shadow of the demon lord then go for it my advice for you would be play shadow of the demon lord it is a really good game it has a bunch of different books you can buy the base book and just have complete adventures with the book alone and then you can buy additional books uh, additional content additional spells additional monsters like there is so much good stuff in Shadow of the Demon Lord itself and you don't have to play it as a like this grim dark fantasy. You, you can just make it regular fantasy if you want. But overall very interested to see where Shadow of the Weird Wizard will go in the future. I will definitely keep my eye on it and yeah. But put your comments down below what you think about the system right now. And also tell me if you enjoyed this overview. I usually tend to make videos on stuff that I have mostly played already so I have actually something to say because I want to emphasize take everything with a grain of salt I haven't played the game I have now only read the book with you guys and that is the extent of my knowledge of the system so I feel like making an overview of all the games it doesn't add anything to it unless I actually show you how the game plays and all that stuff because that is the most important thing I can nitpick all the rules in the book but if I have never tried it before I can't really say how the game actually plays but it's a new game that is coming out and I just wanted to give you guys a like a heads up and overview to see maybe if it, this would interest you so yeah leave your comments down below if you want me to do this same kind of style overview of other upcoming new RPGs. 
But that's all for me today. Thank you once more from the thousand subscribers. And if you want to support me even further, you can now become a culinary role-playing guild member down below by clicking the join button. But for now, it's Moro Moro and I hope I see you in the next one.